Good afternoon and welcome back to the Double Duck Garage and to video number 12 of my MGTF engine rebuild series. Uh, the engine is back in the car and I am now going to get the cooling system set up. This is pretty much the last big job and I'm hoping that by the end of this video, fingers crossed, I will have a complete cooling system and a running engine. So uh, yeah, this could be the big one. Let's see how it goes. So actually thinking about it, there's a few quick jobs I need to do before I actually start working on the cooling system. So I've just torqued these two bolts up to 85 newton meters. They're the gearbox to engine. And there's two more bolts underneath that are gearbox to sump and they get torqued to 40 newton meters. They've been done already. A second quick job is just to reconnect the flexible fuel pipes to the hard lines. Next job, exhaust manifold. Exhaust manifold to cylinder head, 45 newton meters. The manifold fits on the five new studs that previously fitted, not forgetting to install the gasket first. This is the gasket that sits between the manifold and the downpipe. Manifold to downpipe, 50 newton meters. The downpipe is joined to the manifold using six studs, locking washers and nuts. It's also supported by a rubber hanger. One more job to do and that's to sort out the cooling system. I've got all new silicon hoses and a PRT to fit. That's an upgrade on the previous thermostat control system. And um, hopefully this is going to be another step towards no more cooling system problems ever, no more blown head gaskets ever, etc. So uh, yeah, let's make a start. Some of the hoses actually aren't too bad to match up at all. This one is blatantly obvious, so I'm going to start with this one. This goes to the inlet manifold. This will go to the top of the new expansion tank. It clips along here. Okay, next I'm going to fit this. This goes from the bottom of the expansion tank to the thermostat house. Now there's nothing in the kit that looks quite like that. However, I have this. Um, I don't no anywhere else on the car where this would go so i think that this is a shorter more direct version of that which is probably a good thing because this is definitely not a good design this in my car this was bent right around like that severely restricting flow uh, i'd actually had to temporarily put a jubilee clip around it to force the to force some shape into the hose so replacing it with something more direct like this and i'm hoping this is the right piece makes a lot of sense unfortunately at this very moment it started raining so uh, that's gonna have to wait after an awful lot of messing about i finally sussed out that that pipe that was bent double was actually a bodged replacement for this tiny little link pipe and if you're wondering why I didn't make loads of notes when I took it all apart, it's because I was going to rely on another MGTF as a template for putting this back together. I've just been to have a look at the other one. It's a VVC, it's got an oil cooler, and the plumbing is completely different. So a bit of lesson learned. They shouldn't make assumptions because uh, sometimes they come back to bite you. Just so you can get orientated, this is the coolant rail. This is the link pipe that goes from the coolant rail to the thermostat housing. And this is where the larger pipe from the expansion tank need to come down to. And all of this is underneath the inlet manifold. It was then actually quite easy to find the correct pipe to join the expansion tank to the coolant rail. Right, so this is the other end of the coolant rail. According to the diagram that I have, this one is the bypass, so the heater return, and this one is the radiator return. So this is the famous or infamous PRT, pressure relief thermostat. Um, the way this works is, and I'm gonna have to uh, look at my phone as well, look at the diagram on the phone. So, so apparently, According to this diagram I've got, the way this works is the coolant from the engine block comes into here. When the thermostat inside here is closed, 
the coolant will then come out of here and this is the bypass and that will connect to the coolant rail and feed back round into the engine block. So basically you've got a loop of coolant being pumped around, being heated by the engine block, not being cooled by the radiator. The other side of the PRT fits to the return pipe from the radiator and coolant can't flow through it until the thermostat opens. So at this stage there's no coolant flowing through the radiator, therefore no engine cooling and the engine can warm up quite quickly. The thermostat in the PRT will be heated by the coolant flowing through the bypass and will open at its set temperature, allowing coolant from the radiator to flow to the coolant rail and to the engine. This weird multi-hose takes coolant from the engine output to the heater and also to the bypass pipe on the coolant rail. If the original thermostat was still in place and closed, this bypass would allow coolant to circulate and warm up, as well as enabling the heater to work whilst the engine is warming up. This is the engine coolant output. These are the hoses to and from the heater. The silicon multi-hose from the engine coolant output goes here. Weird looking hose this one. On the VVC car it's actually made up out of separate sections. This one is the original return pipe. So this comes from the return from the radiator. That goes to the heater. That which is cracked, this is the bit that actually broke um, back at the track last year. That comes up to the coolant rail and um, then round to the thermostat housing. Now, because this is the return, this comes via the PRT now. So I've got to work out how to get from the PRT to the heater up to the coolant rail. So we now have a short length of hose and the wire connector is there. Uh, this is the broken end, so uh, I'm going to have to get a replacement. But it will sit in there for the time being just to get everything sorted. The branch off of the wire connector is underneath it and I have a choice of four hoses, one of which I'm sure will fit and that will connect the wire connector down to the heater. And the winner is number one. So we're coming off of the coolant rail, into the short length of pipe, into the Y piece, and down to the heater. Just one more hose to fit for the coolant return. That goes between the PRT and the Y piece, and will hopefully be one of these four. Right, so I found the correct hose for that. I had to spin the PRT by 180 degrees, so it now looks like this. We have the return towards the near side of the car, sort of facing the clutch hose. Thought it might be useful just to move that coolant outlet multi-hose out of the way and uh, that way we can get a much better view of the uh, PRT and the return hoses. There are times when working on a mid-engine car is not easy. Uh, I managed to strip these bits off the VVC, it was a hell of a fight. Uh, nothing has shifted on that car for an awful long time. Uh, it is a non-runner, um, and though it's just awkward to get to, these hoses were well and truly stuck fast. But uh, a bit of perseverance and a lot of uh, bad language, and I got there in the end. I have the Y piece, thankfully it's in really good condition, so uh, that can go straight onto the car. There you go, you can see the difference between the broken one and the good one.
This hose that goes down to the heater is not actually touching the clutch brace, but it is very close. I'd notice that if I lift the PRT slightly, I get a lot more clearance here. So uh, it may well be worth making up a bracket to hold the PRT in a good position, just to avoid any problems with uh, pipes chafing later. That's it for the coolant return feeds. Now to replicate this, goes from the engine outlet down to the PRT and also to the radiator. And I have these three hoses. Thankfully, all three are the same as what's on there, so I must have used the right ones elsewhere. So, although I didn't really want to take pieces off the other car, it's just as well I did, because uh, look at the condition of this hose. There's no way that was going to last very long. I was going to get this other car up and running, which is probably going to be the next project, by the way. If, um, it's either going to be this or it's going to be some work on the RAV4. I haven't quite decided which one yet. But uh, one way or another, I'd have had this up and running and that hose would have given up quite quickly and um, could have ended up needing to do yet another head gasket. That did take a bit of jiggery pokery to get it done. I did have to disconnect the return pipe from the PRT to the coolant rail. I also had to relocate one of the heater hoses so that it went down between two hoses on the um, on the T-piece. A um, little bit difficult to describe, easier for me to show you, but um, I think it's there now, so it's looking good. This is obviously the return pipe that I've uh, temporarily removed. Heater pipe from the Y connector goes down between those two hoses on the T-piece. The coolant output is plumbed to the top of the T-piece. The bottom of the T-piece goes down to the PRT. I think hopefully you can just see it. The side of the T-piece that goes down to this pipe from the radiator. I can now replace that return hose that I removed. I'm getting a bit worried about the weather. I've just gone out to get all of this stuff. So I have everything that I need to fill the car up with all the fluids that it needs. Yeah, two minutes later, it's raining. <laughs> Chucking me down hotly now. I think it's time for a cup of coffee and a tidy up in the garage. It chucked it down for an hour or so, so I've got some work done in the garage. Uh, it's actually really nice and warm, so it's actually drying out already, which is good. Um, what I've done, done is taking the opportunity to get the car off the stands and uh, put a bit more oil in. Uh, it actually takes four and a half litres from completely empty and uh, that's if the filter is changed, which uh, obviously I've got a new filter in there. Uh, so I think the next job is to get some gearbox oil back into it. So from empty, 2.2 litres of MTF 94. The car needs to be level when topping up the gearbox. This wheel's gonna have to come off again. And uh, what I wanna be able to do then is lower the car down so the center of the hub is at the right height. The center of the hub is 28 centimeters off the ground.
This is the gearbox filler plug. So I'm not happy that the car is completely level. So I'm actually going to do it with a spirit level and uh, get it dead right because I don't want any issues with overfilling the gearbox. Right. I think that's pretty much as low as it can go and uh, I'm happy with that to be honest. So uh, let's get some oil into it. It's not high tech, just that fluid until it starts leaking out of the filler hole. That's annoying the mess I've made in my driveway. I had a metal tray a sheet and some kitchen towel under there and I still managed to get it all over the driveway every time I look at these tyres I remember just how much fun I had blowing the head gasket on this thing I think I'm at the stage where I can do the final checks and then try and start this um, given the swamp piece at the bar quite high with his VVC just coming to life within a couple of seconds um, I've got to I've got to beat that so I have a 5 amp fuse here connected to a couple of test wires and my meter you can hear that so uh, there's definitely continuity now what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to put this between the battery and the car just to check that there's no massive current draw because obviously I've done a lot of work on the electrics so um, better safe than sorry don't want any uh, major problems uh, I'd rather it just blew this fuse than um, something called fire or something. That's not bad, that's nearly 12 volts. So the battery's understandably a bit low, which is fine. It's been standing for seven or eight months. Uh, but um, that fuse didn't blow, so it seems to be fine. Uh, there's nothing horrendous with the electrics. So I think I'm going to get my jump pack next and uh, connect that up, connect the battery up and um, see if I've got power to stuff. I am going to, for the time being, disconnect the fuel pump, which on my car, I'm in the boot, and it's this relay at the back. You'll also notice that I haven't put the cat and back box back on. So yes, it might be a bit noisy, but it's still quite early in the day. I'm not gonna run it for very long, but I uh, found out the hard way that if you crank the car for long enough, and if it won't start, you can get unburned fuel in the cat and in the uh, back box, and it can end up with quite a big bang and uh, they can be totally destroyed. So let's see some lights on the dashboard. Yep, yeah, brilliant. Up the top there is one I'm particularly interested in because that's oil pressure. The important thing at this stage is to see that oil pressure light. Uh, the reason for disconnecting the fuel relay is so that I can crank the car over on the starter and make sure that I get oil pressure before I go any further. Oil pressure light at the top left. So this should take a few seconds. Um, and then hopefully it will build up oil pressure and that light will go off. Uh, obviously, like I said, it's not going to start yet because I've uh, taken the relay out so the fuel pump can't run. Okay, so, um, don't know, don't know. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. No. Okay. 
done a little bit of research, read a few forums, it seems that the theory that the oil pressure light will go out just on the um, starter motor crank may not be correct. Um, it may just not be able to build up enough pressure. Uh, so really there's two things to note. Firstly, it should be okay to run it for about five seconds anyway. Uh, secondly, I've got all that pre build lubricant in it, which is really nice, thick, gunky stuff. Um, I'm actually better off trying to start it than just crank it and crank it and crank it because if I keep cranking I could actually use that lubricant and it will wear off the uh, parts that it's trying to protect. Um, it's actually better just try to start it. If the oil pressure light doesn't go off within five seconds or so then maybe I've got a problem. It doesn't actually necessarily mean it's an oil pressure problem. It could be electrical. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, yeah, if so if the light doesn't go off, I need to go back and check the loom and um, just make sure that I haven't missed something. Um, but I think there's not really much I can do. I can't put it off any longer. Just got to give it a go and uh, hopefully, you know, just keep my fingers crossed that light goes off, but just not let it run for too long regardless. Just going to see if I get the nice familiar sound of the fuel pump priming. I'm hoping the camera picked that up, but that sounds good. Moment of truth. Hell yeah. And the oil pressure light's gone out. Which is as noisy as hell. <laughs> yes. Right, stonking. So we have oil pressure. Um, it will start so I can get my uh, cat and back box back on. But uh, bloody hell, she's running. Well, that's absolutely stonking. I am well chuffed. Uh, it's not the end of the project. I'll be back out here tomorrow. I've got the back box and the cat to put on. I've got the uh, suspension to torque whilst uh, the car sat on the ground and the bushes are in the right place. I've got that water to take out of the cooling system and uh, replace it with proper coolant. And uh, then I can think about just trying to move the car around, check if the clutch is okay, uh, give it a few other checks and then see if I can put it in front of MOT, ASAP and uh, see if I'm road legal. Thank you.